Thank you, Lord, that revelation knowledge will flow freely, uninterrupted and unhindered by any satanic or demonic force. Father, I pray that you will speak through my vocal cords and think through my mind. None of me and all of you. And we give you glory and honor and thanksgiving ahead of time. We're ready to hear. In Jesus' name, we pray. And everybody said, amen. amen. If you have your Bibles with you tonight, would you go with me to the book of St. John chapter 10? St. John chapter 10. I want to share with you tonight eight steps to destination prosperity overflow. <laughs> St. John chapter 10, verse 9 and 10. <clears throat> verse 9 says, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Now Jesus is talking here and in verse 10 he says there's a thief that will steal and kill and destroy. Now sometimes people blame God for doing things he had nothing to, to do with and they don't quite understand how come you know the des destruction showed up and the stealing and the killing folks there's a devil loose and he wants to kill steal and destroy but now notice what Jesus said he says I am come that they might have life Zoe life the very life of God that they might have the the life of God, this God kind of abundant life. I have I've come so they might have life and they might have it more abundantly. Now, the Amplified Bible reads like this. He says, the thief comes only in order to steal and kill and destroy. Jesus said, I came that they might have and enjoy life. How many of you know it's all right to enjoy life? In fact, uh, turn to your neighbor and tell them, get a life. I mean, it is all right to enjoy life, praise God. Go get you a blow pop, get on you a jet ski, and enjoy life. All right? Now watch this. He says, I came that they might have and enjoy life and have it in abundance to the full till it overflows. Jesus said, he said, I came so that you can have life in abundance to the full till it overflows. You see, if anybody should have life in abundance to the full till it overflows, it should be us. Why, if somebody were to walk up to you tonight and ask you, what kind of life do you think you ought to be living? You ought to tell them life in abundance to the full till it overflows. Somebody says, but I don't understand. I, I, I thought you were supposed to live moderately. Well, Jesus said, I came so you could have life in abundance to the full, till it overflows. In fact, don't even pull up the little moderate trick. The word ain't in the Bible but twice, and in not one time does it mean in the middle. He wants us to live life in abundance, to the full, till it overflows. I don't think you understand. Let's stay on that a little bit. Turn to your neighbor and tell your neighbor what kind of life you should be living. How should you be living life? Tell them. In abundance, to the full, till it overflows. So if you're not living life in abundance, to the full, till it overflows, you're not living life the way Jesus has intended for you to live life. And I'm not going to allow Jesus' coming to be in vain, for he came 
so that I can have life. Ah, oh, yes, amen. Yes, amen. So that means I'm not going to stop until I'm living life. Don't tell Shaquita and Pookie that you ought to be living life in abundance. Amen. That's where we're going, praise God. We're not stopping until we live life All right, now let's get in the spirit of faith on this because the spirit of faith doesn't talk about what we're going to do. The spirit of faith goes ahead and enter into that thing right now. So I need you to say this out loud with me, and I don't care how ridiculous it sounds to your little flesh ears. Get rid of it. Say it right now because we're getting ready to go to this thing. I'm not going to wait one more second to get what Jesus came to give me. Say this out loud. I live. I live. Life. Now, now, in abundance, in abundance. To, the to the full, now, now, now. Don't come tell me about your bank account. I don't want to see your bank book. I've already seen the only account book I need to see. And Jesus said, I am to live life in abundance to the full till it overflows. I have an announcement tonight. It is the will of the Lord Jesus Christ for me to live life in the overflow. All right, now notice, notice. <laughs> he, he, he says, I came so you can have life in the overflow. Now, now, now I'm going to make a point here. He didn't come, he, didn't, he said, I didn't, he didn't say, I came so you can have money in abundance or healing in abundance. He said life. He, he, he's including all of that. He's including, he's including uh, 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 abundance of wisdom, abundance of anointing. He, uh, he's including a, a, a abundance of health. Uh, he's including abundance of money. He's not excluding money. He's including money. But he says, I want to cover every area of your life. I want to take care of all of it. See, you know, I don't want you to just have an abundance of money and then have a crazy wife at home. I mean, what, what good is that? He said, I want you to have abundance in every area. We've got to understand that money by itself cannot define and does not define our life of abundance or our life of prosperity. Money by itself cannot do it. You, most people hear abundance, they hear prosperity, and they want to immediately say money. Money is a part of it, but it's not the whole thing. It's just a piece of the whole pie. But see, God talking about every area of your life. He wants you to have days of heaven on this earth. He wants you to have life in abundance. I'm talking about he wants the vacations to be good, want the marriage to be good, want the children to be right, want the job to be right, want your health to be right. Want, when you kiss your sugar, he wants the, want the kisses at home between husbands and the wife to be right. He wants your intimate time to be right. It's all good. That's what God wants. God wants it all to be good. Amen. <laughs> yes. Life. That's our destination. That's where we are. Now, what I'm going to do tonight, and if I don't finish tonight, uh, uh, my next uh, service, I'm going to show you the steps to take to arrive at destination, life in abundance to the full, till it overflow. And I'm gonna get kind of picky with it because there's some things that we have to do in order to make sure that God is able to do all that he said, okay? So rather than, you know, going bit by bit, let me give you the roadmap right now and then we'll go and look at it and break it down, okay? If you're wanting to arrive, the first thing you've got to get a hold of, folks, and you think you got to understand the first thing, the primary thing that's got to take place in your life is the Word of God. The Word of God is the origin of all prosperity and abundance. You've got to get that straight. Now, the Word of God will produce your thinking. Number two, your thinking. The Word of God will produce your thinking. 
your thinking will produce, number three, your feelings or your emotions. Your feelings or your emotions will produce, number four, your decisions. Your decisions will produce, number five, your actions. Your actions will produce, number six, your habits. Your habits will produce, number seven, your character. And your character will produce, number eight, your destiny. If you will apply this process, Satan will have no room, no room at all, to stop you from getting a hold of what you need to get a hold of. So let's start with step one tonight, the Word of God. Let's deal with the Word of God. Now, folks, the Bible says in the book of Genesis, in the beginning was the Word of God. So if God began with the Word, we got to begin with the Word. So whatever you're starting, you're going to have to start off with the Word. Whatever you're doing, you're going to have to make sure that the Word is the foundation for anything that you're doing. It's got to be the basis for everything that you're doing. You know, I thank God for the Word of God, but you know what? We've got to spend enough time with the Word of God until we can get a Word from God. Because a Word from God, because we're spending time in the Word of God, is how we're going to experience breakthrough. Now, I thank God that you're reading the Bible. That's good. But we've got to spend enough time with that written word until we can crack open the shell and get on the inside where the intimacy takes place and the secrets are being shared. There's something that happens when you get the word from God. Thank God for the word of God. But when the word from God shows up, then you have what you need to go ahead and see breakthrough take place in your life. And so the word of God is the origin for all prosperity. Now, if you'll look at 1 Peter uh, chapter 1 and verse 23, he says, we were born again, not from corruptible seed, but from incorruptible seed. Incorruptible seed is seed that never fails. Incorruptible seed is seed that will always produce. He says, we were born again from incorruptible seed. So the origin, the origin even of our new birth showed up and came as a result of the seed of the Word of God. You heard the Word one day, you responded to it, and as a result, you were born again. Now, if your born again experience showed up as a result of the Word of God, please understand your abundance is going to show up as a result of the Word of God. Please understand your prosperity is going to show up as a result of the Word of God. Please understand your overflow is going to show up as a result of the Word of God. So we're never going to become so mature that we can separate ourselves from the time that we need to spend with the seed. The Word of God is the highway to the world of wealth. The Word of God is the gateway to heavenly blessings. That's the place where we get it to happen. We spend that time in the Word. We meditate in that Word. You know, in Joshua chapter 1, uh, verse 8, he tells Joshua how to make his way prosperous. Make your way prosperous. Meditate in that Word day and night. Make your way prosperous so you can have good success and so you can understand how to deal wisely in the affairs of the world but it's gonna be born out of the time that you spend in God's Word. I can't tell you how valuable it is to begin to meditate on the Word of God where abundance and prosperity in every area of your life is concerned. It's gonna start with that Word. And so when we begin to look and understand that the Word of God is the origin for all prosperity, that the Word of God is the gateway to heavenly blessings, then we begin to understand where the real anointing and power comes from to propel us from one level to the next level. Now, begin to understand that it is the Word of God that delivers men from poverty. It's the Word of God that delivers men from lack. And I'm not just speaking of lack of money. 
It's the word of God that delivers from a, a lack of health. It's the word of God that delivers from a lack of peace. And it is also the word of God that delivers from a lack of finances. But it's the word that delivers from poverty. The word of God is what delivers. Now, let me show you a couple of scriptures here because why, why would you want to go to a poor country and preach the word of God on abundance? Why, there are many people who will say, don't you dare do that. Well, you know, we're not just like all you Americans. You just can't come over here and preach this. But folks, they're wrong. I can't tell you how wrong they are. I was in Papua New Guinea uh, a year and a half ago and 50,000 people were just standing out there in the rain hearing the word of God. I started getting concerned about them, so I started kind of rushing to get through. And the next day in the minister's conference, uh, one of the representatives showed up and he said, man of God, he said, if we're hungry, we can eat when you leave. If it rains, we will dry off soon. But please don't rob us of the opportunity of hearing all that God has brought you to say to us. So I preached for two hours and 30 minutes the next day. You got to tell me twice. <laughs> all right, I want to show you something here. Go to Luke chapter 4 and Matthew chapter 11. Luke chapter 4 and, Ma and, and Matthew chapter 11. The power of preaching this word to the poor and what Jesus said. Luke chapter 4, verse 18. He said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach the gospel, watch this, to the poor. To preach the gospel to people who lack something. I mean, if you just keep reading the scripture, you can see that this, this is a category of people that lack something. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted. The brokenhearted was lacking something. He sent to, to preach deliverance to the captives. They were lacking something. To recover sight to the blind, they were lacking something. So when you're talking about poor, you're talking about lacking something. So he says, here is the answer for lack. Here is the answer for people who are lacking in any area. Preach the gospel. Now, now watch this. And that's why the devil gets so mad when you have conventions like this. I mean, the whole convention has been set aside to preach the gospel to everybody that's lacking something. Glory to God. Amen. That's why you're so wild. I walked in here tonight. I said, where am I? Those people out there are praising God like they lost their mind. Like we finally, like we finally got the mind of Christ. I'm up here in the Great Lakes regions and they praising God. I thought this was the first Pentecostal church of Christ and God in Jesus. Now go to, go to Matthew. My God, I started to run out here and just do a little dosy do and run back in the back. Boy, boy. Having some cha-cha out here, boy. Look at that. Matthew chapter 11 now, when John had heard in prisons the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and, and said unto him, Art thou he, or should we come, uh, or, or, thou, or thou he that should come, or do we look for another? And Jesus answered and said unto him, Go and show John again those things which you do hear and see. Now watch this. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the leopards are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. Now notice in verse five, notice the solution for the blind man. It's what? Sight. Notice the solution for the lame man, walking. Notice the solution for the leper to be cleansed. Notice the solution for the deaf, to hear. Notice the solution for the dead, to be raised up. But notice the solution for the poor, to have the gospel preached. To have the gospel preached, man. There's something about preaching this thing that'll get man out of his lack. Why? Because we're sowing seed. Folks, you were made from the dust of the ground. God intended for you to be the receiver of his seed called the word of God. Hallelujah. It grows in you. Hallelujah. It comes up out of you. I, that's why I said guard your heart with all diligence for out of it flows the 
issues or the forces of life or life itself come as a result of the word seed that has been sown on the inside of you. Your life is a sum total of the seeds that have been planted on the inside of you. So Satan saw God playing this game, so he tried to do the same thing. So now it's a battle of word seed. Who can get their seeds in the ground and get the harvest to grow? So now Satan took the instrument that we should own and we should have called tell a vision. It's television because it's supposed to tell a vision. It's just been telling the wrong vision. But we are about to have a takeover. Yes. And we're going to use that thing for what it was created to be used for. It was created so that we can tell God's vision and make a mark in this world that cannot be erased. It's a battle over what seed, what seeds are going on the inside of you. Amen. See, folks, we got to understand something. This is so important here. Please don't miss this. Word seed controls. Word seed controls and is responsible for all increase in every human endeavor in life, in the kingdom of God. Please listen to me. Word seed is responsible for increase in the kingdom of God, in every human endeavor, not money seed. Word seed is responsible not money seed. See, word seed will determine if your money seed will live. It's, it's, it's word seed in you that's responsible for the increase that you'll enjoy. Let me give an illustration. You can be, let's say you have this, this preacher on the pulpit who he just does not believe in financial increase. He doesn't preach it. He doesn't have revelation of it. He doesn't believe in it. And so consequently, he's never experienced it. But now every Sunday when the bucket comes by, he puts something in the bucket. He puts money in the bucket, but he's never experienced a financial increase. Why? Because it's the word seed that is operational on the inside of you that will determine the life or the increase of your money seed. See, there's something about knowing what the word said that moved you to give in the first place. And it's the word seed that adds backbone to your money seed and adds root to your money seed to cause it to do what it needs to do. You see, we just can't enjoy ignorance and continue to run to the steps and put our money down because you just gave it away. But if you'll get that word on the inside of you and that word becomes operational on the inside of you, then increase in your life can be enjoyed because of the word seed that is living on the inside of you. I mean, with all your heart, you believe that you're supposed to tithe. Yeah, I'll say that, Lord. Uh-huh. You see, I don't need to look for a commandment to make me tithe. I tithe because I honor God, I love God, and I respect God, and I got to give him 10% of all my increase. Well, you know, Bible, the, uh, Brother Dollar, the Bible does say in the book of Malachi, you know, bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, you know, you'll be cursed with a curse. He was talking to rebellious people. I'm not rebellious. I don't, I, don't need him to, I don't need him to command me to tithe. Abram didn't need a commandment that day when he won the battle of the kings. He was just so excited and, and honored God and was honored by God. He says, I got to give him 10% of everything that comes in. Jacob was just so honored for his deliverance. I'm going to give him 10%. And all the way down today, I, I don't, listen, it's not what I got to do, it's what I get to do. You see, you see, I don't, I don't have to bring the first fruit of my increase. I'm, I, I get to. So when I get a first fruit harvest and can bring a first fruit offering, I get to bring it. 
Somebody said, well, you know, Brother Dollar, what if you win the lotto and, and, and that was the, you know, the first of your increase? Do you got to get a whole thing? Well, you just disqualified yourself because it's supposed to be given out of honor, not out of somebody making you do something. And that's what we got to get to, folks. We give because we love God. We give because we honor God. We give because we respect God. I get to tithe. I get to bring offerings. I get to give first fruits. Maybe that's why Jesus in the Gospels never gave a commandment to tithe. Now, he makes some commentary on it when they were fussing about it in Matthew 20, 23, 23. He talked to him. He says, you do this, you do that, you tithe and that, and you ought to. Yeah. But he didn't give a commandment in the gospel to tithe like he gave a commandment to pray. Like he gave a commandment to walk in love. Wonder why. Well, I mean, that, that was already established. He said, I didn't come to, to, to tear down the law. I came to fulfill the law. But he wanted us to understand if you keep this commandment of love, I ain't got to talk to you about tithing. Because you love me, you're going to want to share with me every time I bless your socks off. Every time something awesome happens in your life, every time you find yourself bringing a paycheck, you got a job. You love God with all your heart and soul and mind, and you can't wait to cut that 10% off and present it to him because you love him. Well, now that's, that's, that's the seed of that word that's moving you, it's operating on the inside of you. It's taking you to levels to do things that you've not done before. God's word is our covenant platform for prosperity. It's the platform for prosperity. And so no matter what you give until the seed of the word is in place, there is no future for your money seed. Until the seed of the word is in place, there is no future for your money seed. Until the seed of the word is in place, there's no future for your money seed. Until the seed of the word is in place, there's no future for your money seed. Thank God for Kenneth and Gloria Copeland that give people the opportunity to come here for six days and get the seed of the word in the proper place. You follow what I'm saying? Oh, don't you let nobody tell you you're wasting six days of your vacation time going out there listening to all them people I preach about money. Child, you can be in Florida somewhere getting you a tan. Yeah, you'll burn up. That's what, you know, yeah. You <laughs> but think about it, man. You're going to go home this weekend and you're going to have dreams of, 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 of floods, tsunami floods just flowing over your life, and you're trying to figure out, what is this, well, what is this, this tsunami? Why, why this big, how come there's a big old flood, about, about 38,000 feet high, whoa! And the Lord say, that's what I'm about to bring in your life in overflow proportion. I declare overflow in your life in tsunami proportions! everywhere in your life. I'm talking about that marriage that's not working. It, I command it to work in the name of Jesus. I'm talking about those teenagers that ain't working. I, I command them to work in the name of Jesus. They're not only going to be what they need to be, but they're going to be more what you thought they were going to be. And I, let, I don't want to leave this out because I'm trying to get people, I'm trying to get them to see that God's concerned about every area of our life and not just the financial piece. See, you can have a billion dollars in the bank and still be broke. Why, if you got a billion dollars in the bank and you're dying of cancer, you're still poor. That's right. Amen? Amen? So the Word of God, we got to start there. So now, here's what I need you to do. Whatever you're doing, back up and see if you can locate the Word from God. Because everything you're doing should derive and come from the Word, from God. Because that's the seed that'll cause the thing to grow. Get you some prosperity overflow seed in you. Cause it to grow. Everything starts with some seed. You're, you, you were made out of the dust of the ground. You're supposed to receive that seed. Get that seed in there. Get these tapes. What are you doing? Putting that seed in. How come you keep listening to those convention tapes over again? Getting that seed in there. Because whatever's going to come out of me is going to come as a result of what I put in me. And I am on purpose.
purpose putting some prosperity overflow seed in me and I'm guarding my heart so nothing will come and take it out and then out of my heart flows overflow. <laughs> okay? Number two, let's go to the second piece. Now, folks, let me tell you something about words in general. Words, whether they are negative or positive, will produce the way you think. Words. Words. If you look at CNN all the time, and I mean, that's fine, but you got to watch words. You got to surround yourself with words. Oprah, Maura Povet, <laughs> reruns of Jenny, whatever her name was. <laughs> words. So we choose to get a hold of God's incorruptible word. Amen. Now, if we are in God's incorruptible word, those words will produce the way we think. The way we think comes from the words we surround ourselves with. Go to uh, first, third John. Third John. Mm-hmm. While you're turning there, turn to somebody and say, I'm supposed to be rich. I'm supposed to be rich. Thank you, Lord. And turn to other, turn to the other side and say, in every area. In every area. Mm-hmm. That's right. I got life in abundance. I got life to the full. It's overflowing right now. I'm sitting here minding my own business and my life is overflowing right now. <laughs> sitting here listening to the word. I'm sitting here with my abundant to the full overflowing self. <laughs> oh, Lord, have mercy. First John. Oh, but third John, see y'all done got drunk in the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Verse 2, Beloved, I pray above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospers. Uh, beloved, I pray that you will come to the level desired. I pray that you come to the level that, that I desire as a father. God's a father. And God's made promises. I, I pray that you come to the level of, of, of what I promised you in every area of your life. And, and, and I pray that you will be in health because I'm your, I'm your daddy. I want you healthy. I want you to enjoy life. And you can't enjoy life if you're sick. All right? That you prosper and, and that you be in health but he says now, it's going to be to the degree of your soul prospering. Your soul is made up of your mind, your will, and your emotions. Your soul is made up of your thinker, your filler, and your chooser. We spent a considerable mind over the years talking about our spirit and even our body, but I believe we've got to spend some time talking about our soul. Because please listen to me. Proverbs 23, 23 says, as a man thinketh, as he thinketh in his heart. Now, you study that word heart out, it is referring to the, the faculties where the decisions are made. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. He says here, you are how you think. Now, if you think you're going to be broke like Uncle Jim, get ready for it because now your thinking will set the course for you to arrive at that place. How's your thinking tonight? What, what, what who, who's framing your thinking? Who's framing your thinking? What are you hanging around and who's framing your thinking? You, 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 in Genesis chapter 12, flip over there just for a moment. Genesis chapter 12 and verse 1. While you're turning there, peek over at your neighbor and say, I'm working on something. 
and I'm going somewhere. Genesis 12, verse 1. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindreds and from thy father's house unto a land that I'll show thee. Now I'm like, God, why, why are you going to tell the man to get out of his father's house and, and leave his kinfolks? I mean, what's going on? Here's what God was saying. Get away from those people who are framing your way of thinking. Get away from those selfish Chaldeans who are framing your way of thinking. I cannot talk to you about blessed to be a blessing if you are surrounding yourself with words that are framing your thinking contrary to what I'm, where I'm trying to get you to go. You can't hang around a bunch of broke-talking, defeated, you know, wrong-talking stuff that, I mean, you're hearing it, you're not... You're not participating in it, but it won't be long before you start participating in it if you hang around that stuff all the time. You got an auntie that just every time you look around, you come over the house, hey, ain't Maddie, how you doing? Well, you know, I'm just broke as the Ten Commandments that Moses dropped when they came down from Mount Sinai. <laughs> you don't know why she say that? Trying to get a dollar, just trying to get a dollar. Ah, uh, well, you know, you know, you know what it is now. You know, you, it's always, you know, what, depending on what, who in office now. You know, the re Republicans in office now. Now, you know, you know, about, you know, so, you know, that's why we ain't got no money. That ain't why you ain't got no money. The reason why you ain't got no money, no health, no happiness, no husband is because that red little thing in your mouth that you just let go out of control and say all kinds of things. And it's controlling the way you think. It's controlling the way you think. How are you thinking right now? Who's framing your way of thinking? God knew immediately when he showed up in the garden that day in Genesis chapter 3, and he called for Adam. Adam, where art thou? <laughs> Check out Adam. I, I, I'm naked. <laughs> Here's what God said. Watch this, because God knew, God knew, God said, God said, who told you that? In other words, who you been talking to? See, I call that the Genesis question. Who have you been talking to? I didn't tell you you were naked. You know, the same thing going on today. We still need to deal with that Genesis question because somebody said, I'm going to die of this cancer. And God said, who you been talking to? I didn't tell you you were going to die of this. I've been, I've been broke all my life and I ain't going to never get no money. I ain't going to never be able to live the way they talking in that convention. God said, who you been talking to? That's not what I said. I'm not going to ever be able to have a successful marriage. God said, who you been talking to? I didn't say that. Who you been talking to? Who been framing your way of thinking? Get out of quitting them house talking all that stuff. I can't talk to you about abundant overflow because you keep going back to those people that are framing your way of thinking to oppose the word of God. See, folks, that's, that's really the bottom line to the flesh. The flesh is not bad behavior, but rather bad thinking. It's not sinful action, it's wrong way of thinking. See, when the Bible in Galatians talks about the works of the flesh, you can't work none of them until you think them. You can't commit fornication uh, until you're thinking. I mean, I, I, some people claim they didn't, they weren't thinking it, you know, they like... You know, they got, they, they woke up the next morning and they said, golly, <laughs> golly, I'm in the bed. How did I get in this bed? And who is this next to me? And how did my clothes get off of me? I don't know how this happened. Yeah, a thought assisted you. And we, we, we've got to understand this, folks. The, the, the flesh is more than just bad behavior. The flesh is thinking that opposes the Word of God. It's thinking that opposes the faith of God. It's thinking 
that opposes the love of God. That's what the flesh is. It's, it's in opposition to the things of God. And when somebody tells you you're supposed to be average, that's the flesh. That's a way of thinking that opposes the Word of God. I mean, let me give you just a real simple thing. Somebody says, oh, praise the Lord, God's going to heal us one day. Sounds spiritual, but that's the flesh. Because by his stripes, ye were healed. So walking in the Spirit, you get to the very bottom level, it's a way of thinking that lines up with the Word of God. Jesus said, my words are spirit and life. See, some people try to be spiritual, and it really turns out to be spooky <laughs> because you can't find the word. I call them spooky pookies. You know, people that are doing just like stuff that's, that's not even in the Bible, and they're just doing this weird stuff, you know. Yeah, Yeah, I mean, look spiritual, but it's spooky. Spooky pooky. See, because Jesus said, my word is spirit. See, the word will make you spiritual. But if you try to be spiritual without the word, you're spooky. Hallelujah. The Lord told me to oh, yeah, take this dollar bill. Mm. He said, if I just run around, holler about seven times, he'll give me a million dollars. Oh, yeah. oh. And then you sneak up to him and say, you believe in Tyler? No, I don't believe in that. Well, you know, looks spiritual, but it's spooky. All righty then. See, I got some of y'all. Some of y'all just look at me like, what you trying to say? <laughs> you know what I'm trying to say, Pookie. <laughs> you know what I'm saying, Pookie. Uh-huh. Let me show you something. Look at uh, 1 Corinthians 13. So you see, folks, sinful actions come from a wrong way of thinking. Poverty comes from a wrong way of thinking. Lacking abundance and overflow comes from a wrong way of thinking. We've got to get our thinking in line with the Word of God. We've got to start agreeing with what we are hearing in, in this convention, man. We've got to start agreeing with these words that, that are coming forth, man, and getting ourselves lined up with this, with this word and agree with it and get our thinking in line with this, man. You've got to think it, man. You've you got to think in abundance to the full, to it overflows. God is a father. He loves me. I know he loves me. And because he loves me, he's not going to have me struggling all my life because he loved me. God sure enough loved me. He, the Bible said I'm the apple of his eye. He know how many hairs I got on my head. Well, what if you're bald headed? He know the number is zero. <laughs> because he is intimately acquainted with every detail of your life. <laughs> All right. Come on, let's get in the spirit. In fact, folks, that's a very interesting point because, because later on, you're going to find out in this convention, man, the law that governs abundance is the law of love. Yes, sir. Amen. That's bottom line. Yes, sir. That is the law that governs abundance, the law of love. And if you don't, see, it's, it's great that we know that we love God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, with all of our strength, and we love our neighbor as ourselves. But now, so, so equally as important is for you to believe and have faith in the love that God has for you. Real Bible faith is faith in the love of God. Because when you have faith in the love of God, then you, when you read his principles, then you know because he loves you, what he said gonna work. Because he loves you, what he promised gonna come to pass. And you go around and say, you know what, I know what the doctor said, but the Lord Jesus loves me. 
And because he loved me, he said right here, by his stripes, I'm healed. I'm healed. I'm here. You can't tell me no other way. Why? Because the Lord loved me. I'm going to tell you that right now, Doc. He loved me. There's something about having that confidence. There's something about having that way of thinking. In fact, let me, can I stay there just for a moment? Amen. 1 Corinthians 13. The, uh, 1 Corinthians 13, of course, he's talking about the way of love throughout this whole chapter, but he goes down here in verse 11. And he says, when, Paul said, when I was a child. Now, you know, children are basically by nature what? Selfish. When I was a child or when I was selfish, I spake as a child or selfish. I understood as a child or selfish. And I thought as a child, selfish. That was my way of thinking. That was my way of thinking. Lord, you want me to say that? Okay. He said, but when I became a man. Hallelujah. All right, now, he said, when I became a man. So I, 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 I'm sure that he had to change his thinking to become a man. Because there are a lot of men that think they're men, but they're really perpetrating because they're just males, because you're not really a man until God breathes into the nostrils of your life, and then man becometh. In other words, without God, you're not even a real man. You're just a male. And just because you can make a baby, it don't make you a man. It is God that makes you a man. Hallelujah. It is love that makes you a man. It's the fruit of the Spirit that makes you a man. It's, 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 it's living a life with, 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 without any selfishness and learning how to be selfless that makes you a man. Yeah. Gentlemen, don't get quiet on me now, bro. I'm trying to help you. I'm trying to help you. There's a reason. There's a reason why Shaquita don't want you blowing in her ear no more. Because she thought she married a man and she keep turning over every night and seeing a male. Now, all I'm saying is, you know, a, a man thinks love, walks in love, demonstrates love. Love's not a weak message. It's your power. It's how you're going to get into this prosperity overflow. It's sowing a do-good seed when somebody did something wrong to you. It's overcoming evil with good. Yeah. Power to the people. <laughs> Some of y'all dudes looking at me like. <laughs> I right, what happens then when you don't think that God loves you? Look at Deuteronomy chapter one. You got to know because God loves me, it is his will for me to live life in abundance to the full, to the overflows. But if you don't think God loves you, then you will tolerate the lesser. Deuteronomy chapter one, Moses was telling the story of how God provided guidance to the wilderness and, and how he chose leaders to watch over the the. The, the people and how the spies reported, but then something happened in verse 26. They started murmuring. Ooh, I'm glad I didn't pass to this church. <laughs> verse 26, notwithstanding, you would not go up, but rebelled against the commandment of the Lord your God. They rebelled. Well, why would you, why would anybody rebel against the commandment of God? Verse 27, he said, and you murmured in your tents. Now at church, you said one thing, but when you got home, you murmured. And you said, because the Lord hated us, he hath brought us forth out of the land of Egypt to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites to destroy us. See, they thought God hated them. And when you think God hates you, you'll rebel. 
When you don't believe that God loves you, you will rebel against his commandments. And that's why it's so important that we believe that God loves us. Because he's given us some commandments. He's given us some love letters that have been designed to assist us in life. And he that knows all about life and created life wants to show us how to miss the traps in life and just obey what he's saying. But if you think, if your thinking is in line with, well, he hates me or he's, he's holding out on me. You know, that's basically what happened in the garden when, 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 when Satan showed up and, and, and asked the question, you know, what did God say? And, and Eve told him and, 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 and he contradicted God he, with words and said, uh, you shall not surely die. God knows that if you eat of this, this fruit, that uh, you'll know the knowledge between good and evil. Now, the first thing he wanted to do is to get them to think that God was holding out on them. And God's not holding out on them. And God's not holding out on you. The Bible says he gave his only son. He's not going to withhold anything from you. Oh, glory to God. For you to think you ain't going to get the car and he gave you his son. That you're not going to get healed and he gave you his son. That you're not going to get delivered and he gave you his son. God's not holding out on you. Turn to your neighbor and tell him, God's not holding out on you. And they rebelled against the commandment of God because their thinking was this. I feel like God, I think that God's hand holding out on me. And they rebelled. And all they had to do, all they had to do is say, go up to God and say, hey, daddy, we got a question. What, babies? Could you explain to us the knowledge of good and evil? Why, sure. Come on up here. Let me talk to you. I created this archangel one day, made him beautiful, put instruments on the inside of him. He was tough, man. Anointed sheriff. Mm-hmm. But, uh, he got too much of himself and he did this and he explained the whole thing. They didn't have to rebel. But isn't that what we do? At any time something happens and we think God doesn't love us, we rebel. That's got to stop. Well, I was going to give an offering today, but I don't understand why the Lord let my mama die, so I'm going to keep my money. No, we don't, we don't say it at church. We, we say it in the tents. See, folks, you got to know God loves you. You got to know that God loves you. In fact, go to, go to Mark, and I'll continue on after this. Mark chapter 11. Yeah, boss. Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1, verse 11. Say out loud, I know him, I know her. That God loves me. That God loves me. Therefore, Therefore, He'll prosper me. He'll, prosper. he'll heal me. He'll, heal me. He'll, he'll deliver me. Deliver me. Amen. Amen. Because He loves me. Right. Yeah. He loves me. Yes, He loves me. Hallelujah, He loves me. Look at verse 11. And there came a voice from heaven saying, Thou art my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. He said this before Jesus opened any blinded eyes. He said this before Jesus healed anybody. He said this before Jesus fed a multitude. He said this before Jesus did any miracles. He wanted Jesus to know that you don't have to do something to try to get me to love you. I'm calling you my beloved before you do anything. And you know what? He's called us his beloved. Hallelujah. We are his beloved. Praise the Lord. It's that way of thinking, folks, that's going to bring us into the place where we want to be. We cannot miss out on the way of thinking that God has, has, has uh, uh, meant for us to think. Our mindset is what we got to conquer. We got to conquer the mindset. When we conquer the mindset, we can conquer our life. But if we don't conquer the mindset, it'll be very diff diff difficult for us to conquer our life. Okay? Now let's go to, let's, let's see if we can cover one more tonight. The Word of God will produce thinking that will line up with the Word of God. Thinking that lines up with the Word of God will produce emotions that line up with the Word of God. And now listen to this very carefully. Because it could be that 
when emotions take charge of your life, that could be the number one enemy to our prosperity. Let me, let me give you a definition of emotions. Emotions are feelings on the inside caused by pain or pleasure to move you in a direction. Hence the word e-motion. E, up, out, and away, motion. Emotions are feelings on the inside caused by pain or pleasure to try to move you in a direction. That really was the ultimate sin in the garden that day. Because, listen, folks, God gives us emotions, and they are a gift. They're gi a, they, emotions are it's a gift from God. But you've got to make sure that emotions never take charge of you. You've got to make sure you have emotions to make sure your emotions don't have you. Now, please listen to this. In that garden, they were seduced. They got into their, to their emotions. Their emotions moved them. Motion moved them out of the will of God for their life. And every time the devil wants to move you out of the will of God for your life, what he wants to do is tap in to your emotions by introducing some words, governing a way of thinking, and then getting your emotions to line up with those first two things. If he introduces negative words and gets you into negative thinking, then your emotions will line up with that. And they will move you out of the will of God for your life. Now, Jesus had emotions, but emotions never had him. He demonstrated that in Hebrews chapter 4. The Bible says he was, in verse 15, he was touched with the feelings of our infirmities. And then he demonstrated it in Mark, I believe, chapter 14, verse 33. In fact, turn there. I want to show you something out of the Amplified. Mark chapter 14. When you don't take charge of your emotions, they will take charge of your life. And if they take charge of your life, then they're going to move you or get you in motion away from the will of God for your life. Now watch this. Verse 32. They were in the garden. Jesus was in the garden of Gethsemane. And they came to a place which was named Gethsemane. And he saith to his disciples, sit ye here while I shall pray. And he taketh with him Peter and James and John and began to be sore amazed and to be very heavy. And saith unto them, my soul is exceeding sorrowful unto death. Tarry ye here and watch. Verse 35, and he went forward a little, fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. Now listen to this in the Amplified. It breaks it down a little bit. Verse 32 Start at verse 33. And he took with him Peter and James and John and began to be struck with terror and amazement, deeply troubled and depressed. And he said to them, my soul is exceedingly sad, overwhelmed with grief, so that it almost kills me. Remain here and keep awake and be watching. Now that explains the pressure that was in the garden that day. But notice Jesus had emotions, but they never had him. He never allowed them to take charge of his life, even to the point where he had to sweat blood resisting. Amen. And I am telling you, if you have not gotten to the point of sweating blood, you hadn't resisted long enough. But notice what's happening here. Here is the enemy trying to move him out of the will of God for his life like he moved Adam, the first Adam, out of the will of God through his emotions. And he shows up and Jesus resists him because he had authority and he could take charge over those negative emotions. What happened? That day, he demonstrates to us what to do when pressure is coming on you in the area of your feelings to try to get you to get emotion away from the things of God. He knew he was supposed to come and down that cross. He knew that was the will of God for his life. What did he do? The scripture says, first of all, he went forward. Somebody shout went forward. went forward. He went forward. That's what you do when your emotions attack you. You know what the will of God is. You, you understand the will of God and then feelings come up to try to stop you from doing the will of God. Here's what you do. You go forward. Somebody shout, go forward. Go forward. You might have to cry, but go forward. go forward. You go forward. That's what you do. And then the second thing Jesus said, he kept praying. 
You go for it and you keep on praying. You go for it and you keep on praying. Now, you don't think this is important? Let me set up an illustration for you because I know lots of Christians who just keep missing the mark, going on a detour because they won't take charge of their emotions. Their emotions, when it's time to give, and then something comes up and emotionally moves them out of the way or emotionally moves them into a place where they don't need to be. And then they don't do the will of God for their life. Now watch this. Here's a guy who's got a brand new car. He's riding along and somebody hits him from the side. Bam! He pauses a little bit. He says, I got to take authority over my tongue because if I say the wrong thing, if I can control my mouth, I can control my whole body. All right? He knows the will of God. He gets out of the car. The guy that hits him, comes up with a bad attitude, gets in his face, it provokes him, he loses his tongue. He said, what? You gonna come up to me and talk to me like that after you hit my car? Boy, you don't know where I come from. I used to come from a tree, I cut you up, I kill your whole family. He go crazy, you understand? <laughs> so the guy got too close to him and he just gets lost because he kept running his mouth and before you know it, bam, he hit the guy. The guy said, ooh, I'm, I'm going to press charges against you. Got press charges against him. They arrested Buddy because Buddy committed battery on this guy, all right? So they took him and they put him in jail. Now, he was already having problems at work and at home because they said at work, if you're late one more minute, we're going to fire you, so you better make sure you're here at work. But see, he got arrested on, on, a, on a day that the judge was out of town for three days, and so he got to stay in jail for three days until the judge get back. Now he lost his job. Well, his wife at home know ain't no money gonna be coming in and she hungry, a little greedy too. So she decided, I'm not gonna stay here, I'm leaving. And now all of a sudden he saw himself way over here when he was that close to the will of God. But notice what moved him from the will of God all the way over there. It was his unwillingness to take charge of his emotions that got him out here where he's supposed to be. Or you take some basketball player or some sports player and he gets mad at the coach or mad at some administrator and he decides to walk off. And, and then he messes up there because his emotions got in the way. Or you got some husband who got four children at home and a wife he needs to take care of and he wants to go to work and quit because he don't like the way they spoke to him. <laughs> emotions just moving you all different kind of places because we don't use the authority that we have to take charge over our emotions. Or hey, let's just get right in where, you're, where, where you live. Or marriages that allow their emotions to come in there. And you start talking about stuff and you say, baby, I really need you to spend a little time with the children. Well, you know, I, I work too, you know. You know, you, you don't do nothing. Well, baby, I just asked you to spend a little time with the children. What you trying to say? You trying to say I'm a bad father? She ain't trying to say that, but your emotions are taking charge of your life. And now you're in an argument, you're fussing about stuff, you're doing things and your emotions not go to the office. And there's a little secretary who wear a little skirt that looked like it's been painted on. And she used to be bow-legged, but now she not needed, so she walking like this now. And your emotions are moving you into places where you don't belong, and you end up in a situation where you're doing something that you don't need to be doing, but you allowed your emotions to take charge of your life, and your emotions moved you out of the place where God wanted you to be. Folks, we got to understand how to take charge of those emotions because they've been responsible for the downfall of too many Christians that were standing right there and facing their breakthrough. But the emotions thing, I'm telling you, you have authority. You are not powerless over negative emotions. I said you're not powerless over negative emotions. You have God-given authority that has been given to you to take charge over your emotions. You are not powerless over weaknesses in your life. You are not powerless over trouble and circumstances in your life. You have been given authority by God to take control of those emotions and bring them in the check and you, that you don't let them, you don't let them take charge of your life. You have emotions, but you don't ever let those emotions have you. Bless God, you're going to be rich no matter how you feel. You understand? You know, I was one day doing a, I was prepared, I was, I was preparing to do a, a teaching on, on anger. I was going to teach on how bad it is and, and all this other kind of stuff and, and how y'all not get anger and angry and I was sharing some uh, on personal testimonies in my life and I started studying it and uh, I kept running into the anger of the Lord and the anger of the Lord and the anger of the Lord. I said, oh Lord, I said, uh, ooh. 
So I started kind of like counting it up. How many times, who got angry the most? <laughs> and it turned out that God got angry more than anybody. I said, uh-oh. And so I looked it up in the Greek and in the Hebrew and in all the translations, and I still couldn't find my way out of that. And I said, well, Lord, okay, let's look in the New Testament. And then I see Jesus getting angry. Turning tables over, <laughs> whipping people. I said, oh, Lord, what is this? You know, you and your son, y'all got an anger problem. <laughs> <laughs> you know? So I asked the Lord, I said, now, you know, you holy and righteous and and, and, and you said, you know, you know I, I said, Lord, you need to help me with this. I need, to, I need to hear you. You need to talk to me. And the Lord gave me three words. I think it was fire, power, and sex. And I said, okay. And he asked me a question. He said, uh, fire. I said, yes, sir. He said, is it right or wrong? I said, well, it depends on how you use it. He said, okay, power, right or wrong? I said, it depends on how you use it. He said, sex. I said, it depends on if you married and <laughs> how you use it. <laughs> then he said, anger. I said, for real? How you use it? I said, okay, Lord, show me something. Then I found a scripture where God talked to Saul and he said, and the anger of the Lord was on Saul and the anointing came on him. I said, well, what? I said, Saul got ticked off and the anointing came on him? He said, you don't get it. He said, you don't get it. He said, there are a lot of people that are tolerating the things of the devil and they won't get angry enough, the type of anger that will produce righteousness. They won't get angry enough at where they are presently, so consequently they remain there. And he said, son, I need you to understand that if you'll get angry at lack and angry at debt and angry at sickness and angry at disease and angry at mediocrity till it moves you to do something about it. He says, what do you think it would have been like if Jesus would have walked in that day into the house of God and said to all of these guys in there, you know, you're turning this place into a den of thieves, but praise the Lord. <laughs> Maybe that would have been sinful because of his casual attitude at unrighteousness when on the inside there should have been something to stand up on the inside and say no this is not the will of the father this is not what he designed it for and i'm not gonna get out of here i'm not gonna let it happen this shall be called a house of prayer you made it into a dentist give me them whips wham now i'm not advocating you turn folks table over and whip them but I am saying, go home and look at your checkbook. If it is not in abundance to the full and overflowing, you and your wife need to get angry at whatever situation in your life that's stopping you from arriving at that point. I'm believing in these last days that we won't tolerate this mess that we've been tolerating for these years. We have a God of abundance and he's waiting on somebody to get passionate about what he promised them in the word. Passionate. I was reading the other day the son of Eliezer. Israel came in and, and they committed idolatry and, and this one dude just decided to bring this woman in and this guy, this priest, this son of this priest took them both and he killed her and he killed them 
And the Bible says, I'm going to increase him because of the zeal he had for me. Where's the zeal that we have for what God promised? Where's that wildfire zeal that says God said I'm supposed to live life in abundance to the full till it overflow? Honey, if I were you, if you're living in a shotgun house, I'd just go home and pack one suitcase and just leave it downstairs just to let the devil know what I'm intending on doing. Let him know that I am here right now, but I don't plan on staying here all my life. I'm on my way out of this thing. I refuse to tolerate me being here all my life. God made me a promise. He said I could have life in the full, in abundance until it overflows. He said it, I believe it, and that settles it, hallelujah. Passion. Letting the word stir up holy emotions. Like the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 2. Holy emotion. It's time to get angry at unrighteousness. It's time to get angry at those things in your life that you've settled for. God's trying to do something bigger than what you can think. So what do you do? You elevate your thinking. Why? So he can do it. So he can do it, and you start demonstrating it to others how powerful and how awesome my God is. You understand me? You take authority over your emotions right now. Don't you let your emotions begin to lead your life. You take charge over those emotions. I mean, the degree of the blessings of God will be based on whether or not you take charge over those emotions. I'm telling you right now, you take charge over negative emotions and get rid of that sense of powerlessness and take hold of that authority and use it and make your life exactly what the blueprint of the word says it should be in abundance to the full to the overflow stand up man we'll finish this tomorrow and stand up now now what now now listen listen i want i want i want to read this i want to read this i want to read this while you while you stand up because i want you to do this Oh, let the nations be glad and sing for joy. For thou shalt judge the people righteously and govern the nations upon the earth. Let the people praise thee, O God. Let all the people praise thee. Then shall the earth yield her increase. And God, even our God, shall bless us. God shall bless us. And all the ends of the earth shall fear him. I'm going to ask you, without no music right now, just the fact that the word said it, and you're going to do it. How many of you believe you're supposed to live life in abundance? Yes. To the full? Yes. Till it overflows? Yes. How many of you received the night that you're living life in abundance? Yes. Living life to the full? Yes. Living life to your overflow? Well, go ahead and let's get this earth to release the increase. Praise it. Oh! Oh, glory, we praise you. We thank you, Lord, that we live life in abundance. We thank you that we live life to the full. We thank you that we live life to the overflow. We give you praise. We give you praise, O oh God, for who is like unto thee, O oh God. We honor you and we bless your name, God. We receive your blessings right now, God. Woo! In the name of Jesus, we give you praise. We praise you now. We thank you now. We honor you, O oh God. We receive your increase. We, we get into your word. We change our thinking. We take charge over our emotions. 
We bless your name, oh God. We bless your name, oh God. Everything is going to be all right. We bless you, oh God. We take things out of our hands and we put it into your hands, oh God. We humble ourselves under your mighty hand. We refuse to carry the care, Lord. We put the care in your hands, oh God. Woo! 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 <laughs> oh God. Oh Lord, we pray. Oh Lord, we praise you. We're ready, God. You can trust us, Lord. You can trust us to distribute for you. You can trust us with this soul winning plan that you have. When it starts running out of our cup, Lord, we know what to do with it. We bless you tonight, God. With every head bowed and every eye closed. If you're here tonight, you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life. Listen to me tonight, folks. You can make a quality decision to come out of darkness into the marvelous light. Things don't have to remain the same. Some of you are sick and tired of being sick and tired. And I'm telling you tonight that, that, that God gave his, his, his beloved son. He so loved the world. I mean, he loved us when we were in the world. And he loves us now. Listen to me, marvel not, I say unto thee, you must be born again. You get to be born again. You get to make a decision for God right now. And now is that opportunity. Now is an opportunity you have to make a decision to let Jesus come into your life as Lord and personal Savior. Tonight, you can change your destiny by changing your life. So if you're here tonight, you say, Brother Dollar, that's me. I'm ready to get born again. I'm ready to come out of this mess. I've tried all of the rest, and now I'm ready to try the best. I'm ready to do what I'm supposed to do. If that's you tonight, would you just lift your hands up right where you are? You're just, you're just putting your hands up. You're saying, look, I want to get saved. I want to get saved. I see a hand right there. I, I want to get saved. I'm, I'm ready to give my life to the Lord Jesus. I see a hand there. I'm ready to make this decision to make Jesus Lord of my life. I see a hand there. I'm ready to get real about this thing, man. I'm coming out tonight. See a hand over here. You can put your hands down. Because Satan is a loser. He's about to lose you. He's a loser. He's about to lose you. Secondly, you're here tonight and... I don't know, somehow you kind of drifted away from the word and drifted away from God and just kind of, you know, not standing in your faith and you're, and you're saying, you know what, I want to come back to God. I want to, I want to do this thing right, man. I want to live according to God's word. I want, I want to change my thinking, man. I, I, I got it infected. I'm ready to be what God wants me to be. And you want to rededicate your life to God? Lift your hands up right now all over this place. You're saying, look, I'm coming back to God. I'm ready to do what I got to do tonight, man. I ain't playing. I'm going to do what I got to do. I see hands all over the place. You can put your hands down. Now listen to this last thing. You know, if you've never been filled with the Spirit of God, with the evidence speaking in tongues. Now, you know, the evidence really that you're Holy Ghost filled is, is that you're love filled. <laughs> you know, it's one and the same. But you know, God wants you to experience what it's like to pray in tongues and release wisdom. To pray in tongues and to pray about things you don't know about to pray in tongues and impact situations that may be going on clear across the world. And whatever the Father wants to give you, take it. If that's you, lift your hands up. You want to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues tonight, God will do it for you. He'll do it for you, man. You can put your hands down. Now listen to me very carefully. Those of you who raised your hands, I want you to get your Bibles and personal belongings and I want you to start making your way down front. But everybody else, you might be standing by the next Kenneth Copeland. I want you to turn to them in just a moment and ask them, hey, would you like to get born again? 
you want to rededicate your life to Jesus? You want the baptism of the Holy Spirit? And if they say yes, I want you to grab them by the hands and bring them on down here. Let's clean the house tonight, man. We're in the overflow in every area. So right now, those of you who raise your hands, come on, right now. Everybody else, sick them. Turn to your left, right, front, behind. Come on. Nothing but the love. 